Today, banking code red for branch closures. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics World Notice Post, covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, Dale Webster over at the regional continues her tireless quest to raise critical issues about branch closures and about the poor practice amongst the major banks. So she wrote in her most recent article, Today we learned three things. The banking code of practice isn't worth the papers written on, the format for emailing Westpac Executive directly, and the Anablise Australian Banking Association will only engage with journalists who give them an easy run. Despite being reported across Australia last week as agreeing to a parliamentary request to pause all bank closures, while an inquiry examines, among other things, the welfare impacts of removing banks from communities, Westpac closed the branches at Hay, Moree, Catherine and Kanamar today. The closure at Kanamar in Western Australia went ahead despite the entire Westpac executive, including head of legal Shannon Finch, being in possession of information that the post office, where customers were being directed to for basic transactions as an alternative to branch service, does not have a disability ramp and is therefore inaccessible to certain members of the community. The lack of disability access at the post office is no small issue and the pausing of a branch closure due to this is not without precedent, with the closure of the Commonwealth Bank in June initially postponed from December to March for this reason. The Westpac executive were also sent the submission made by the chairman of the Banking Code Compliance Committee, Ian Govey, to the Regional Banking Task Force that raised concerns about compliance issues relating to Part 4 of the Code, which covers inclusion, accessibility and vulnerability. Mr Govey also highlighted that post offices providing bank at post services should also be meeting the standards set out in the Code. This wasn't the first time Westpac had been informed of the breach. Chief Executive of the Shah of Kanamar, Rob Paul, had previously written to the Westpac board and Westpac CEO Peter King twice, and they didn't even have the grace to reply. For this alone, the bank well deserves its mention in the West Australian Parliament yesterday by the leader of the opposition, Shane Love. This bank closure will leave six shires, covering 23,000 square kilometres with no bank whatsoever. Residents from Kanamar will have to make a costly 250 kilometre round trip to either Mora or Dongara, highlighting the bank's total disregard for the banking code of practice, which talks about banks being accessible, inclusive and servicing customers in remote and regional areas. This follows Westpac's closure of its Wangun Hills branch last December, ending a 110-year history of this bank in the town. The closure of Westpac in Wangan Hills last year and NZ Bank in 2021 leaves no other bank in that town, forcing locals to drive hundreds of kilometres to access face-to-face -face banking. The Regional Banking Task Force, which reported in October 2022, recommended that banks establish a process for conducting and publishing regional branch closure impact assessments by mid-2023, no such assessment was carried out in Karama or Wagon Hills. Perhaps this recommendation has prompted the recent rush of regional bank closures nationally. She said, I want to commend local community members who, in both cases, were vocal in their opposition to the branch closures. The Shah of Kamar has left no stone unturned in highlighting the detrimental impact of Westpac's withdrawal. The Australian Bank Association says customers remain at the centre of all that banks do. And knowing that Westpac did not engage or consult with the Kamar community over the closure of the branch, I beg to differ. It's pretty damning stuff, which brings us on to the question, how on earth are they getting away with it? Enter the Australian Banking Association, or ABA. The ABA is adamant that the banking code of practice is legally enforceable. This morning, ABA media was sent details of the Kanama issue and two questions from the regional with a close of business deadline. Could you please set out the pathway by which the code can be enforced? Does the ABA, if in possession of knowledge that the code is to be breached, have an actual or moral role in preventing that breach from occurring? <laughs> Guess what? No response was provided. It's not the first time the ABA still hasn't responded to questions on the Senate request for a bank closure moratorium. 
Dale wrote, I challenge the ABA to come out from the rock it's hiding under and explain how a little council like the Shire of Connemar, perfectly within its right to challenge Westpac on a breach of part four of the code, can have the matter heard by an independent arbitrator, which is what most fair-minded people would interpret as being legally enforceable. Even if there is a pathway of sorts, the code and bank terms and conditions that incorporate it are contracts that have been written to the benefit of only one signatory. They are so difficult to challenge, it is beyond the financial reach of mostly all who have a case for justice against the banks. The whole code, including the branch closer protocol, needs throwing out and starting again. That's another job for the senators. And remember, submissions close March 31 for the Regional Banking Inquiry. We'll put the links below. And by the way, Dale, in her article, also showed the standard format for Westpac email addresses if you want to write to the CEO, for example. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.